Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. We've got a Wonder game for you today. It's been a little while since we were on Wonder, so I figured it was about time to knock out another one of these replays. This is, uh, I think I get the most replays for Canis and Wonder. I get a pretty much significant amount of replays for Settons, and I have gotten less gap recently than I usually do. So, yeah. If you want to see different maps than these, which tend to be a little bit overplayed, please send me replays. Regardless, please send me replays, because I always need those things. Alrighty, just a couple of quick little things before we get started here. Uh, number one, the cast that I did, or the game that I did with Orbital Potato is now online. For those of you who tuned in yesterday on Monday, you saw that I played a game with him real quick. Well, there's another one on his channel. Link is in the description. We had a pretty dang good time with that. And I'm probably going to be doing some collaborations with him as far as actual casting goes. I'm trying to get him a little bit more up to speed on F.A. in particular. He is fairly experienced with strategy games. He's done a lot of them, so he has a pretty good broad knowledge of it, but just not a lot to do with Forged Alliance. Once we get him up to speed on that, I think we'll probably have him in for some actual casts. Um, there was one other thing that I was going to say, and I completely forgot what it was, so we're just going to carry on with our business. Let's introduce the teams and then teams and then see where the game takes us. We've got WSL taking UEF on the air slot, Morax with Seraphim on the right hand side, DB or the headphone guy as most people call him is UEF on the center and Cybern for the left hand side for Grim Preacher. That is the northern team. On the south side we have Zazen taking uh, Cybern on the left side, Stephen with Cybern on the middle. Hush with UEF on the right hand side and Elwood with Aeon on the air. Good old Aeon, master of the T2 skies with the swift wind. It is it is interesting to see how that, that's one way to tell the FA is a balanced game. Very exceptionally well balanced for strategy games because you can have a unit that is as powerful as the swift wind is and you can still have people not choose that faction because every other faction does have an acceptable counter to that single extremely strong unit. And uh, it, it's just interesting how it falls out that way. Of course, Aeon has that super strong unit at the sacrifice of not having a T2 bomber. You're stuck with the Mercy or the gunship, either of which dies horrifically. Horrifically, wow, that was putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Um, they die horribly <laughs> to any form of stationary anti-air. So it's just a trade-off you get. You can master the skies defensively and offensively with essentially a T2 interceptor. Almost an ASF, but not quite. Uh, but you lose out on the actual ground fire capabilities. I see a lot of units stacking up, but I don't see a whole lot of initial aggression. It looks like everybody is pretty much wrapped up in their build order. They're getting factories online, mechs is built, power generators online, and all in all stacking up for the battle to come. Hush will be laying down an auxiliary air factory. It's actually not a bad idea to build your own air. All of the cool kids are doing it now. I know that... Uh, Relying on the air player is a fun thing to do, and I do it quite often. Just last night, I died to T1 air because I didn't build my own air factory because I thought that my air player would actually build air. But, uh, you know, the old motto, never rely on your teammates ever in any situation because they will always let you down. And uh, just build your own air factory. T1 bomber coming out. Uh, that is a Stephen. I am almost wanting to call him Stephen. He does have his own air factory as well, and that bomber is going to wing out and eliminate three engineers from his opponent. That is a brutal loss to take this early in the game. He's only got three engineers left, and all of those are far out away from his base. And a second bomber is coming in. He lays down a little bit of damage on these T1 power generators. He's going to get a chain reaction that kills every single one of them, but no, he is going to go after the engineers. A brilliant dodge by WSL is going to save every single one. One of them losing about half its health, but no real loss. Yet another engineer going down for headphone guy. Luckily, he does have an interceptor up. He is building his own air as well because his air player is not building air. Everyone is building their own air. I love games like this. <laughs> Everybody is all up on top of their own business. Not really leaning on other people as a crutch. That means that more than likely we're going to see a lot of good teamwork later on in the game because everyone will have a variety of units to deal with pretty much any situation that gets thrown at them. 
Balance wise, Steepian is 1800 versus 1600 on the north. It looks like we have 16 and 15 for the north side with an 11. This is roughly balanced. It, it looks it looks pretty good. The center lane is a little imbalanced, but the sides make up for it slightly. <clears throat> Excuse me. T1 bomber coming in from headphone guy. Not really going to accomplish a whole lot. And it's going to go down. But we do now have some interceptors flowing in from Elwood. That's going to give a heavy T1 air advantage to the southern side. Killed off all of Headphone Guy's interceptors. That means we have about 7 NT total between the two players on the south versus 2 on the north. And here comes the T1 bomber. Anytime you have the upper hand in air, you've got to grid aggressive and use your advantage. Laying down some damage on these T1 engineers up in the north. As I always say, if you kill two NGs, your bomber was worth it because you paid for itself in mass. Um, two engineers killed there, so yeah, that was worth it. From here on out, it is icing on the cake. I'm gonna kill two more NGs and stop the power spam. That is getting bad over there. It's exactly what you want to do with those T1 bombers is impede progress wherever you possibly can. Realistically speaking, T1 bombers are a terribly inefficient way to kill most buildings, but they do terrifyingly large amounts of damage versus clumps of T1 units, and they're very, very good at stopping building progress. Best possible uses for them. Lots of T1 anti-air going down over here. That's another version of mass effectiveness for the T1 bombers because these three T1 anti-air turrets that have been built cost probably 10 times the mass of those two T1 bombers that they were built to deny. So just the fact that you had those bombers works out really, really well. Looks like we do have the gun upgrade on Hush. The firing rate may stay the same, but the 200... DPS definitely makes a difference. Morax is under upgrade at the moment. He is getting gun as well, but he has fewer tanks. No more point defense. He's already shed part of his health to the gun upgrade on Hush, and overall it's not looking too fantastic for him asking for E-dumps from the team. He's lost his engineer. You don't want to give up the gun upgrade at this point, because you are 95, 98% complete, but there we go. Now he's got the gun. He is on 6,800 health though versus a 9,000 health commander and he has no units to back him up whatsoever. So I think we may see a death unless a miracle happens. We have another commander moving up. That's a T2 commander putting down a triad. <clears throat> if Morax can hang on for just a couple more minutes, he can drag that ACU into the T2 point. Nope, he's dead. There's no way he's coming out of that alive. Tank stopping to focus fire. Seven, five, three. Boom! But there's the triad online. Hush is very low on health thanks to the nuke. 2400 health. Taking fire from that triad. Looks like headphone guy is pushing up. 1800 health. Bombers coming in to try to kill that T2 point defense. And here come the Mantis to try to save that ACU. 1900 health. He is regenning. Too bad there wasn't an air snipe prepared. That's where you need an Aeon air player. That one single Mercy slipping through the defenses would be able to kill that ACU coming around the outside edge and winging in from the right. He is now on 2,000 health, I think. Very survivable versus any form of T1 bombers and maybe even a couple passes of a couple T2 bombers. And he is back in his home base. So that means we have one down on the North team. It is now a three versus four and headphone guy is going to be expanding into this side as fast as he possibly can. The reclaim is good, the lack of another ACU, and that eco for now is bad. We will gain, though, the focused eco of two players in the capable hands of Headphone Guy. And if he can survive long enough to put that to good use, I think he'll be fine. I think he will, though, because he has a triad down, he has radar down. He'll be able to push back any of the feeble amount of T1 that Hush is pushing. And he should be able to lock down this entire expansion. No problemo. 
here's another area where T1 bombers would be very handy dandy. They could push them up and kill off these T1 engineers that are expanding. If they can continually delay headphones expansion, then uh, it will work out very well for them in the end. Zazen does have the gun upgrade. He's pushing up into the Mantis of Grim Preacher. And he's going to get in range and start overcharging that point defense. Looks like he does have the stealth as well. You can see he's well within range of the Cerberus turret, but the Cerberus can't see him. There is no intel. Even if there was radar, you still wouldn't be able to see him. You'd have to get a scout over his head. There's the radar right there. So that ACU is completely and totally invulnerable to point defense fire as long as he fires from max range. The range on the gun upgrade is longer than the range on, or the vision radius on the point defense. So the ACU is literally sitting five ticks outside the vision radius. It may not even be five, it may be less than that. Um, he's sitting a couple of ticks outside the vision radius of a T2 point defense and he can kill the thing without ever taking a shot in return. It is a beautiful thing to behold. Ant is coming in, they are gonna close visual radius, but that T1 point defense range is not long enough. Zazen does have T2 units backing him up. He's got a mobile flak and a couple of tanks. That is all you really need in this world. That flak can keep air off your back. Tanks can scour the T1 from the surface of the earth while your gun comm tears into those point defense. So, very, very good situation for Zazen to be in. He has Grim Preacher in a tough spot at the moment. Looks like he's going to be laying down a buttload of point defense. Try to deny any pushes up here. Now, you can actually put stealth on all of this with the cyber mobile stealth unit. That would be a good thing to do. You can close in on that base without ever taking a hit until you get in range. T1 bombers moving around the north side a little bit late on the uptick, but I think these will do a fair bit of damage. If only they could have killed off those units before the mass extractors got claimed. That would have been very, very useful. A T1 scout ping is not a bad idea when you're versus a commander like this once you get your T2 point defense up. If you're, I, I know I've said before, <clears throat> scout streams are relatively inefficient and I generally stand by that statement because scouts cost about two thirds the cost of an interceptor. It is no insignificant amount of mass flying away to his death. But if you have a bunch of T2 point defense and the T2 point defense are useless unless you have line of sight, then a scout stream would be worth it. They just build an air factory back here, put it on a continuous repeating cycle of air scouts and string them across where the ACU or stealth units are coming from. Works out pretty marvelously. It's about the cheapest way to get continual line of sight over an area. Nice little mobile missile launcher push right here. Stevian is going to have to get up into this. He has a couple of hoplites on the case, but hoplites are paper in the face of triads. Going to go down from just a couple of hits. He's going to push back those T2 tanks with the sheer force of presence of his ACU. The willpower in that is astounding. And we have a mongoose over here as well. Playing in a little bit of damage over there with that grenade launcher. Mongoose weapons are pretty dang awesome. Gotta say, Elwood dropping resource allocation. He's got three T2 power generators. He's producing mercies. Maybe we'll be able to see a death by mercy. Just have to wait and see. Attack missiles are flying away towards the base, but there are TMDs in the way. We're not going to get one-shot kills on those mechs, but a lot of damage is being done. I have to heal those mechs anyway. If he was launching pairs of missiles, he would actually be doing a lot more damage, but unfortunately that is not the case. No anti-air whatsoever on this position. We've got a lot of swift winds, but they are going to start taking fire from the ground. There we go, moving up. The only interceptors are over here. If he just flies over there and kills those interceptors, then he will have a clear shot at Blue, and Blue is leaving the shield. Headphone guy is in a very precarious position, and he doesn't even know it. Let's take a look at his radar. Nope, he cannot see those. But Elwood can see him. I'm waiting for those mercies to go tear him a new one, but they're just going to continue to sit there. Because yay for missed opportunities. Hip hip hoorah. Sapien getting pushed back hard by pillars. This is a horrifying amount of pillars. 
You never want to be facing this many T2 units, and there goes his commander, exactly like it usually does when you're faced with an army of that size, but no shielding. Let's see how much health he's got. In come the Mercies and 600 health. All he has to do is stand still for one second too long. And oh, thank goodness for TMD. Holy kashmoles. Dance for me, puppets, dance. Ha ha ha. All right, he's above a thousand health. He's still within range of a mercy snipe. There's a T2 gunship in the back. He does have T1 anti-air down. Multiple T1 anti-air. He's got to get some kind of coverage over his head though, because shortly there will be T3 air on the field and one strap bomber hit will take him out. No problem of. All right, it looks like WSL is actually going for a full on land push. I just now realized that all those T2 tanks belong to the air player, which means that our, there is no rush for air. But hey, when you gotta rush this strong and you're gonna kill this many people, actually WSL does not look too healthy himself. There are two tank launchers back there. They're launched at W, but he is moving out of the way at a pretty good clip. I think he's gonna get a second kill here. Hush is in dire straits. No, W, dodge. 1600 health, one stray bullet too many. Here come the T2 gunships and he does not, there's the mobile flag, he's gotta get that shield to him. Shield, now, no, it's too much, 200 health, holy cow. That mobile flak was just in time and he's gotta keep that mobile shield on top of him. T1 point defense going down in the back. That will save Hush. He's at 5,000 health out of 18,000 potential. That is a T2 ACU with several vets on it. And the TML launching again. Thank goodness for mobile shielding. That is the only thing that saved his life. We've got two red health ACUs here. If they snipe DB, the blast will kill WSL. These two guys are... They, they need... Ugh. The early push was brutal. It did its job. But now they're going to have some severe issues because we're about to see T3 air hit the field. The upgrade is going now and these guys have absolutely no counter whatsoever. We have a T3 factory online. Need a T3 engineer. Throw down a couple of SAMs strategically placed across the map in order to eliminate the strap bomber threat. I know the strap bombers are coming. But you know, it may not be as bad as I'm making out because we have a veritable horde of pillars moving down the middle. It's going to totally deny this area. There's T1 point defense going down, but you know, it's not really going to do much good when you got this many T2 units coming in. And these are headed in a beeline directly for the air player's base. And this could end very, very badly. There goes a T1 point defense under fire from a mobile missile launcher, so it's not going to last too terribly long. There it goes. These guys are going to tear into the base. There's a brick online, saving Zazen's butt. He's got a lot of T2 tanks around him. Overcharges probably could have saved his ACU. I don't think he would have died, but the brick definitely makes things better. He's got even more pillars moving in from the right. So having two bricks now online is definitely going to help abandoning part of the build power on the factory in favor of throwing down some obsidians he's got to protect his acu there's no gun upgrade but he does have resource allocation and access to an overcharge focus firing on the acu now ah my word this is going to be this not as close as i think it's going to be i don't think if he keeps moving around and doesn't continually take mobile missile launcher fire, I think he'll be fine. Plus, ouch, WSL is clumping his units up terribly. And that means that overcharges are really, really powerful. But he's at 2,000, 1,000. The mobile missile launcher fire is what's killing him. Another wave of pillars moving in. Oh, he, he no, no, he's dead. No, there's the veteran C, 3,200 health. We're now back to square one. Overcharging another group of four. Man, when you're overcharging four pillars at a time, you vet very, very quickly. 1,400 health. 
and 15. Looks like he is good. All right, the flow of units has slowed somewhat. So I think his ACU will be fine. 1600 health and continuing to regen. Got plenty of Oblivion turrets online. And the gun comm from Zazen is trying to stem the tide of pillars. Actually, he needs to not get surrounded himself. Got Medusa's coming in. Stun will work on those T2 units. That's a nice thing to have. 1,100 health, but you need 900 health. And you're standing still. Here comes the mobile missile launchers again. Ah, Veteran Z, 4,000 health. So close on that one. How many near deaths have we had? We've had so many commanders under 1,000 health get away. This is ludicrous. Restorer's coming out. That was actually a nice choice because these have plenty of health to tank mobile flak. <clears throat> they have their own defense against interceptors. I believe they do trump interceptors unless interceptors are just in massive numbers. And they do have a halfway decent amount of ground damage to deal to these other units. Three bricks, one going down. There are Percivals moving in from Headphone Guy. This is this is an interesting game for sure. Oh, oh, Zazen is going to die. There's no way he's going to live. Two Percivals and a buttload of pillars on him. The health is just flying away. There's a brick in. He's overcharging like a madman. Four vets. There's the fifth vet, but it's not enough to save him. 1,900 health, single person shot. There he goes. 1,600 damage on the Alpha Strike for the Percival. That is a terrifying amount. Two Percivals firing a shot at the same time. 3,200 damage. Sorry. Yeah. I don't know how to math. Um, 3,200 damage. For, the, for those of you who are wondering, I did not just pull out a calculator. I just spaced because my brain kind of freaked out at the fact that I had doubts about what 16 plus 16 was. Okay. <laughs> Moving on from that. Actually, the reason that I am so mentally fatigued, this is a lesson to me and hopefully a lesson to you guys. Uh, I just wasted a solid hour attempting to cast a game that had a desync well before the end of the game, and when the game is desynced, I can't use it because what's happening on the screen is not actually what's happening. So please, before you send me a replay, check for desyncs. If it's like a 30-minute game or something, um, I will buzz through it real quick just to make sure there isn't a desync, but... Um, Someone that normally checks their replays sent me a replay, and I've used games from him before, and I've never had a problem, and it was like an hour-long sentence, so I just dove into it and tried to cast it, and it was desynced at like minute 45. I wanted to shoot myself in the face, but whatever. We're carrying on with this game. The, uh, the carnage is real. We've lost mass extractors out in the front. Elwood is rebuilding, and he still has the T3 air advantage, if you can call it that. There's not a whole lot of mobile flak being mixed in by these guys, and I think that is a critical mistake. When you have an air player like this who has basically no ground infrastructure, but he does have a strong air presence, you should be building a lot of flak. You should be seeing about a flak for every six tanks or so and a mobile shield in there as well. <clears throat> because yes, you're reducing the damage output of your overall force, but if your force is dying to gunships, then it's not really worth much, is it? The voice is cracking too. Ugh, apparently my limit for talking is about an hour and a half. Alrighty, I, I am struggling with this. I'm seeing the GC being built in the back. I see that it is dire straits for Elwood. I think that's the second time this game I've used that phrase. Stop it, Brink. Expand your vocabulary. And I see the T3 air presence, which is all good, but then I look at the map control and the amount of units that are on the field, and I, mm, mm, I'm having a hard time calling this one. It, I think the GC will win it, though, because all of these units are strung out, and most of them are still T2. So you can't use air to deal with it. The GC is going to vet up massively off of all the T2 that's straggling in. 
and there is no decisive front. There's a lot of Percivals on the field, but they're not all clumped together. So the GC is just gonna trample all over them one by one. GC is finished. And that means that Elwood is gonna be able to spread back out again. These guys dropped to about 10% map control. I think we're about to see them rebound. T2 units fleeing in the face of that Galactic Colossus. They saw it completed, and the Percival's kind of halting a little bit as well. No more move orders placed all the way back into the base. GC is going to head directly for the right side, which appears to be the weakest. I don't know. DB is grabbing another upgrade. He already has the shield. He has the gun. He has T2. That's probably the T3 upgrade going down. That is a fearsome commander. Um, lay down a couple of shields to buy you a little bit of time versus that Galactic Colossus beam and with the help of another ACU You might actually be able to overcharge the Galactic Colossus to death, but WSL doesn't really have any upgrades and he is on half health so uh, Slight brush with the laser beam and he is going to go nuclear And GC is headed definitively towards the right gunships tearing into all of those mantis not much of a loss, but well Anytime you vet up a unit. It's probably a bad thing to do <clears throat> Percival's need to backtrack. Get within range of their mobile flak protectors. Ah, now we're seeing a nice little fair bit of mobile flak in here. Things should be getting better all the time. T2 gunships disintegrating in the face of all that flak. Such a huge amount of damage being done by those things. Restorers can tank them for a bit, but even so, <clears throat> they're still going to go down rather quickly. I forgot I have a glass of water here. I got it for the long cast and I totally forgot about it. I'm here struggling to speak and the solution to my problem is literally six inches from my right hand. Slipping Brink, you're slipping. Well, I think due to a little bit of, um, well, nope, never mind. The ASF came in. And the restores are going to go down. There we go. An example of why you should overmix flak. <laughs> the units are now back in the base. They're going to have a similar problem to what they had before, though, because we still have six, seven Oblivion turrets up online. And uh, T1 point defense going down now. Overcharges from the ACU gunships, all kind of nasty business heading towards those units, and they will fail to do anything of significance, I think. Just not enough punch in there. DB is not overcharging or doing anything. But then again, the Galactic Colossus is not hitting him either. Why are you running away? You cannot outrun a Galactic Colossus. WSL going down. No. Overcharges being laid down on the Galactic Colossus. What were these guys thinking? I think it was a problem of lack of scouting. Headphone guy saying, wow. Yeah, I agree. Wow. Hush pushing up, adding insult to injury, going to personally land the shot that kills that ACU. And Grim Preacher is now the only remaining person. I think all of this infrastructure is about to go poof. Hush saying, I'm so happy. Well, of course you would be if you got that kilt. There we go. There's a half-built monkey lord standing between him and a galactic colossus. Can't believe we did not see that. Folks, that is the power of scouting. Or, if you're on the other team, that is the power of the other person being too negligent to scout. Or the other team, rather. Yeah. Scouting, it saves lives. Always remember that, folks. And now we get to watch the slow and painful demise of Grim Preacher. I like the donut. The donut is a nice touch. There's definitely plenty of reclaim to get it online. Get some engineers out there reclaiming, and you will have all the mass you could ever dream of. Only 74 in the hole, 46 in the hole. And he's building that with quite a substantial amount of build power. Kudos to you, my good sir. Cerberus turrets trying to lay down some damage on this Galactic Colossus, but I don't think it is going to happen. Not going to help. Grim Preacher does not have the ability to get in range and overcharge that thing to death. It would take four overcharges to kill it, and 17,000 health is not enough. I'm trying to get the Monkey Lord online, but not going to happen. And that Galactic Colossus is actually probably going to vet. 
36. Well, now he's within range of three overcharges. Grim Preacher, are you going to be able to do it? He can walk up, taking protection from the Monkey Lord. We're now at 31. One overcharge. 17,000 health. Two overcharge. 2,000 health. You've got to be kidding me. GC bugged. What? Oh, Elwood, I turned it off. No, don't do that. I want my donut. Well, I just lost a little bit of respect for you. Not really, not really. You know, we've all done that before. <laughs> You're like, but I want my shiny toy. I don't want this game to end. I have so many cool things that I want to show to everyone, including my second puberty that I'm apparently going through. But yeah, I just don't want to kill it. I'm sure Grim Preacher is feeling so badass at the moment because he just overcharged a Galactic Colossus to death. But I think his thrill is going to be short-lived. He's throwing down a couple of Sams. Looks like an Omni. Uh, I don't think he can build enough Sams in between, in between the time that the donut was built and the time it gets there to prevent the donut. But it is a nice feel-good mechanism. There's a Sam. Maybe if you built a buttload of shields. I don't know. Here comes a donut. Nah, nah. 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 It's the attack of the killer donuts. Somebody needs to make that movie if they haven't already. Donuts. The silent and extremely slow killer. Oh no, it's filling my veins with cholesterol. Whatever am I going to do? Ah, I might die in 30 years. And there goes Grim Preacher. This is apparently the only donut of killing you in less than a 10 year time frame. Well, I don't know. If you ate nothing but donuts, you would probably die much quicker than 10 years. You would definitely die much quicker than 10 years, but I do not recommend an overdose of Czar. Alrighty, guys, that is going to wrap up our replay on The Wonder. Please, please send me your games, and please, please, I am begging you, check them for desyncs before you send them. You need to attach that replay file to an email to the Gmail in my description. Uh, BrinkoInsanity at gmail.com. That is the best way to get it to me with the least chance of desync and corruption because the replay vault eventually does corrupt them if they're left in there long enough. Again, please check out the game on Orbital Potatoes channel if you want a little bit more of a sneak peek into some of the stuff that I do in my spare time. Um, and uh, maybe... I, he has a bit of good content. It, it is personal preference who you enjoy listening to, but maybe give some of his videos a listen if you are feeling up to it. He does RTS games just like some of us do. Alrighty, guys, I'm going to head out of here. Thank you so much for watching, as always, and I will see you guys in the next cast.